Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Leah Debon of Lean Frontiers and I will be serving as your host today. Just a few points of logistics before we get started. Today's short presentation is being recorded, so look for an email shortly after this recording with a link to view the session on demand. Please feel free to share it with those in your organization and perhaps even use the recording as part of a lunch and learn. Also, due to the short nature of this webinar, we will not be fielding questions. However, if you do have questions, our presenter will share their email address and you can email them directly. So with that said, let me introduce our presenter today, Richard Abercrombie. Richard has worked extensively with the Training with an Industry Institute to, pre to bring back TWI to America as one of the core competencies of a lean production system. He is now a master trainer for the TWI Institute and conducts their Train the Trainer program nationwide and globally. Through consulting and training in TWI, Richard helps companies improve their daily work routine management by upgrading supervisor skills in a way that improves basic shop floor stability and brings about greater employee involvement in continuous improvement. So for now, I will hand it over to Richard. Thank you very much, Leah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Lean Frontiers and uh, TWI Institute uh, webinar. As Leah mentioned, uh, my name is Richard Abercrombie, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk with you uh, today. Uh, so in today's webinar, we'll be discussing what is essential for coaching, uh, and uh, in particular, how to get opinions and feelings, and how this ties in with TWI, uh, Training Within Industry Job Relations. Uh, but before beginning, I would like to take a moment for safety and bring your attention to the need for accident prevention and job safety. So the workplace, as you know, is a constantly changing environment, which means that there is a constant need for safety. Um, what safety means is to consider measures. Let me show you this right here. The meaning of safety is to consider measures and take action before a safety incident. It is not to just handle the aftermath. Uh, if we are to think about accident prevention, we have to know what things and what conditions can lead to an accident itself. If we know what to look for, uh, then we can take precautions. Therefore, the meaning of safety is to consider measures and take action. Please, please remember this. So, okay, uh, to begin with, uh, here's a brief, uh, here's where you are. Uh, this will be sort of our agenda for today. Uh, first, we will look at the at TWI job relations from the perspective of the uh, Toyota Kata uh, mindset. We'll briefly review the main aspects of uh, the uh, Toyota Kata, which is target condition, actual conditions, barriers, and next step. In particular, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about barriers. Uh, the real nut of Toyota Kata is understanding clearly the barriers to achieving a, a target condition. And in other words, we have to know what the real causes are behind the factors that result in a difference between the way things should be and the way they actually are at the moment. Uh, so this is critical because without knowing the real causes, uh, there is a tendency to just kind of fish around looking for something that might help. Uh, but once we understand the root cause, uh, we can begin to formulate specific countermeasures uh, that will address these causes directly. So in that regard, uh, I'd like to look a little bit more closely at some of the common barriers to interpersonal communications that generally make it more difficult to understand the whole situation. And then on the basis of that, uh, to take a look at a few concrete but yet specific uh, countermeasures to these difficulties. So let's take a look at the uh, four-step method of job relations. And uh, what is the first step? Uh, that's right, the first step is to get the facts. Uh, notice what we call the uh, caution for step one. It's the line in step one that's in italics right there. Um, <clears throat> in other words, whenever you're um, uh, handling a problem that involves people, 
the target condition of step one is to be sure that you have the whole story before you take any action. Uh, here it's very important to note that the uh, job relations perspective when it comes to getting the facts, uh, this perspective it, uh, considers that in some problems, not all of the facts are uh, obtained until personal opinions and feelings are considered. The, these personal opinions and feelings have to be considered as facts because what a person thinks, right or wrong, uh, it's a fact to that person and therefore we have to consider it as such. To illustrate this point, uh, take just a moment to reflect on this question. Have you ever had a person uh, who had a problem outside of work and then that affected them on the job? Well, of course. Uh, and the thing to remember is that even though it's unconscious, uh, that person brings everything with them every day when they come to work. And that's why it's so important to get to know that person because they are an individual and who they are as an individual affects them on the job. Uh, because when we consider the current condition as it relates to getting the facts, it is common to find that uh, many people believe that because personal opinions and feelings are subjective, um, many people feel like that we should not consider them as facts and rather they actually should be avoided. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more from the job relations point of view. In this method, step one is very basic because uh, all of the other steps uh, depend on getting all of the facts. It's very easy to imagine what happens if you don't get all of the facts and you just jump to conclusions before taking action. Now remember, what a person thinks or feels, as I said before, it doesn't make any difference whether that's right or wrong. It is a fact to that person and therefore we have to consider it as such. Uh, this is critical because your decision on how to handle the problem uh, can only be based on what you know. So to clarify the current condition, let's dig a little bit deeper into how we communicate in the workplace. So in the main, there are at least two uh, different schools of thought about how to communicate in business. Now the first school takes the point of view that the goal of communication is to get the other person to agree with your opinions, your ideas, uh, the facts and information that you have. Uh, this is usually thought to be the best if it can be done without too much fuss. Now, the other school takes the point of view that actually very little communication has happened until uh, differences have come out and uh, been explored. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of how these two schools of thought operate. Our purpose here is to see which approach is the best strategy for reaching our target condition, which is getting the whole story. So here's the boss. Uh, this boss is Smith. Uh, he seems to be a friendly and congenial chap. Uh, actually, he's a very logical and reasonable person, and he wants to make a constructive improvement to the operation. So he explains it to Bill, uh, the operator, in order to get his agreement. Uh, Bill, I think this is the best way you should do your job. And here's the response that Smith gets from Bill. Oh yeah? So uh, there might be a little bit of a problem here. Now Smith assumes that uh, he understands what Bill means when he says, oh yeah? Uh, Smith has translated uh, this expression into, I don't agree with you. Now um, Smith, he's reluctant to give up on Bill, so he continues to explain to Bill uh, and to try to get Bill to come to agree. And what happens? Well, so far things are still not going too well. Now the other thing that happens is that the more Smith cannot get Bill to understand, the more frustrated and uh, emotional Smith becomes and the more Smith's ability to reason logically is diminished. 
Now, since Smith, Smith sees himself as a reasonable, logical chap, uh, this is a difficult thing for him to accept, uh, and it becomes much easier for him to simply perceive Bill a bit differently. Um, Smith begins to think either Bill is just being uncooperative, or maybe Bill is not the brightest light bulb on the Christmas tree. Uh, but here's the thing to keep in mind is that these perceptions will affect what Smith says and does. Under these pressures, Smith begins to evaluate Bill more and more in terms of his own values, and he tends to treat Bill's as unimportant, essentially denying the uniqueness and differences with Bill. He begins to treat Bill as if he has little capacity for his own self direction. And this message is likely to be clear to Bill. So I think we have a barrier to the target condition. Be, be sure you have the whole story. What do you think? Well, let's see. Uh, let's leave this sad scene between Smith and Bill, uh, which I fear is going to end with uh, Bill either uh, stomping out in a huff or being kicked out of Smith's office. Uh, let's turn for a moment to the second uh, school of thought about how to communicate in business. Now, school number two takes a different approach. Uh, the view here is that communication does not occur until two people are willing to bring out and express and talk about the differences that they have. So here's a different boss. Uh, like Smith, Jones wants Bill to change the way that he does his work. So she says, Bill, I think this is the best way you should do your job. And Bill, of course, he says, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but in this case, Jones takes a different approach. When Bill says, oh yeah, uh, Jones doesn't assume that she knows exactly what Bill means. Uh, in this case, she decides that she's going to find out what Bill actually means. So it's a little bit like, um, I wonder what's going on with Bill. Now, at the same time, uh, she is under no illusion that her endeavor to understand uh, will be purely a logical interaction with Bill. She, uh, on the other hand, she assumes that what will happen will primarily be an interaction of feelings. And therefore, she knows that she cannot ignore uh, Bill's opinions or feelings about what she wants him to do. Jones wants to see if she can uh, understand from Bill's perspective how this affects him. So in other words, so what's up with Bill? So instead of putting a lot more pressure on Bill to agree, she starts to ask questions. So she says to Bill, well, I guess you don't think much of my idea. Is that is that really how you feel? Or this question, so tell me how the way you see it. And another good question, is this really what you assume? Now remember, opinions and feelings are not always easy to get, uh, but it is a skill, we can all learn it, and we can develop this skill. Once this skill is acquired, uh, it becomes a very useful tool for anybody who coaches. So just how will Jones find out about Bill's feelings and opinions? Well, of course, she's going to encourage Bill to speak about what's important to him. Uh, it may not be the same as what's important to Jones. And she's not going to interrupt him. She doesn't uh, want to argue with Bill. She doesn't jump to conclusions about what it is that she thinks he's thinking about. She doesn't do all of the talking herself. And here's the clincher. She's going to listen to Bill. Now, as Bill begins to open up, Jones's curiosity is piqued by this uh, process. And uh, she begins to think about Bill in this way. Uh, Bill's not so dumb. He's actually kind of an interesting guy. That becomes Jones's attitude, and that 
that is what Bill hears. Therefore, Bill understood and accepted as a Bill feels free to express uh, his differences, and in this process, he begins to see Jones as a source of help and feels that Jones respects his capacity for self-direction. These positive feelings toward Jones make Bill much more inclined to say, well, Jones, I don't quite agree with you that this is the best way to do your job, but I tell you what, I'll give it a try. I'll do it that way for a few days, and then I'll come back to you and tell you what I think. So uh, there's no magic here. Uh, finding out what a person's opinions and feelings are is just a very common sense approach to leadership and coaching. And it is a skill. In fact, knowing what a person's opinions and feelings are and being able to uh, get them out quickly and, and uh, efficiently is probably the most important thing about job relations and coaching. Now, let's go through these tips again. So uh, how to get opinions and feelings. First of all, as we saw, don't argue. And ask yourself this question, was, ever, was anything ever satisfactorily settled if we just argued? So here's the next tip. Encourage the individual to talk about what is important to them. And remember that uh, often it's necessary to help a person to say what's on their mind. So that's why those questions are very helpful. Um, skillful use of questions will make it easier for a person to then begin to talk about what they're really thinking about. Here's another tip. Don't interrupt. Have you ever been telling a story to somebody and they interrupted you? Do you feel like continuing? So if you want to get a person's opinions and, and feelings, don't shut them down by interrupting. And also, this is one of my favorites, don't jump to conclusions. Remember, uh, uh, you probably in your past have had this experience that you spoiled everything by making some assumptions and heading off in the wrong direction. And then also, don't just do all the talking yourself. It's very tempting to often lecture or sermonize. But in this case, uh, how can you find out what a person's opinions and feelings are if they just can't get a word in edgewise? Now, those of you that uh, read my uh, blog last month, you'll remember that a common barrier to effective communication uh, listening is a tendency to evaluate first. And this is our um, uh, next tip on getting opinions and feelings. You have to listen. And uh, uh, it's pointed out here that a good communicator is always a good listener. Uh, but we do have a tendency as we listen to evaluate first. Whatever the other person says, in our own mind, there is a tendency to put our own perspective into the front. And I call this, uh, the type of listening that's called listening for rebuttal. Uh, this usually leads to a type of listening in which you only pay attention to what will be the basis for your counter argument. For example, if somebody says to you, here's what I think, we have a tendency to say, no, 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 I don't agree with that, and here's why you're wrong. Uh, this person is only listening for ways to debate. Now, within this mental framework, it becomes very difficult for anything other than to rebut what the person has to say. Well, that's not the way that I see it. I think you're wrong, and I'm going to tell you why I think that. Or, you know, if, you're, if your thinking would be a little bit more clear, I think you'd see my point of view. Now, obviously, in this mental model, uh, many barriers arise without the diversity of views. And in particular, uh, there's a barrier to any grasp of the other person's perspectives that are behind their attitudes and behaviors. Now, on the other hand, there is this other style of listening, uh, which is called listening for understanding. And it can be illustrated in this way. Well, I'm interested in your point of view. What makes you say that? Can you tell me a little bit more? I just want to make sure that I understand you. Is this what you mean? And then you uh, state what you think that they mean and then wait for them to respond. And 
And you're, what you're looking for is if they say, right, that's exactly the way I look at it. Well, then maybe you've gotten closer to, way, to the way they think. Now, here's a uh, final tip. Uh, while listening for understanding is essential to coaching, as I said before, it does not seem to come naturally, but here's the thing. It is a skill and it can be learned if it is practice. And so my final tip there is there is no substitute for practice. So that's the end of my uh, presentation uh, today. Thank you all for your attendance uh, and uh, your interest in improving human relations in the workplace. Now, uh, before I conclude, there's just one more thing I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, I'd like you to know that uh, some of the material that was used in this president uh, was from an article in the uh, Harvard Business Review that was published in 1952. And the article was called Barriers and Gateways to Communication. It was written by two people, Carl Rogers. Uh, Carl Rogers is considered the co-founder of the humanistic school of uh, psychology. And Fritz Rothlisberger uh, was a professor of industrial research at Harvard Business School. And he was the primary leader of the uh, Western Electric Hawthorne Works research that was done in the late 20s and early 30s. Notably, uh, Mr. Rothlisberger was drafted from Harvard by the TWI service in World War II to help out with the development of the job relations program. So once again, uh, thank you all very much. And as Celia said before, we don't have time for a lot of questions, but if you do have questions, please feel free, jot down my email address and then just send them to me. I would uh, be happy to try to answer your questions. Um, in other words, I'm interested in learning how you see it. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to you, Leah. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for your thought leadership and for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, as mentioned earlier, you will receive an email shortly with a link to the recording of this webinar. So please do share that with those uh, in your organization who might find this information useful. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.